Tick tock, time to rock. How's everyone doing? As we're all avoiding coronavirus, I am here right now with Sean Hurst of Mixed Martial Apologetics and Believing Thinkers, a man who currently has coronavirus. And so uh, I'm just trying to be safe. We're all trying to be safe. I don't want to catch it from Sean. So, um, uh, Sean, uh, I'm sure you're an expert by now, but just for everyone who's watching, can we catch coronavirus from you through the Internet? Maybe. No, I'm just kidding. No, absolutely not. No, we, we can't? But, Are you sure? Because no. Hang no. on, hang on. I, I, I keep hearing, why don't, if we can't, then how come I keep hearing about all these computer viruses? <laughs> huh? Care to explain that one? <laughs> I can't. I'm at a loss. Busted. <laughs> all right, but you're sure we can't catch it? Um, I'm pretty sure, but as a you know philosophy student, uh, I have to. I can't be certain. I can only have a reasonable degree. <laughs> all right, well that's good because this is harder. This is harder to breathe in than it looks. But you should do the Vader voice before you take that off. Oh yeah, I wonder if it sounds like it's easier in a cup. But check this out. Check this out. Now, Sean Hurst, you have underestimated the power of coronavirus. <sighs> All right, that's about all I can do. All <laughs> right, go. let me get geared up here. Ugh. Ugh. That could be Vader on a ventilator. All right, that's that be, better. That could be Vader on a ventilator. <laughs> all right, so, so we don't need to worry about catching this over the internet. All right. Um... All right, so, <laughs> everyone, we're here with uh, with Sean Hurst of Mixed Martial Apologetics. Uh, if you remember um, back, uh, when was that? Beginning of February, when we we're uh, getting together a bunch of a uh, bunch of uh, YouTubers uh, down in South Carolina. Uh, Sean was one of the guys who was gathering together, and we we're uh, sharing tips and strategies and so on. Um, but He's a little bit. He's a little bit. Uh, his channel's his channel's pretty new. His channel, Mixed Martial Apologetics, uh, is new. And so uh, the link to that channel and to another uh, channel, uh, Believing Thinkers, is in the description box. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few uh, in a few minutes. We want to get a little bit of his background. So want to hear from Sean, uh, find out you know uh, how he got into all of this and so on, and then uh, then we'll want to talk about coronavirus because. Um, yeah, if you've got coronavirus, then a lot of people are going to want to know what it's like, how the testing works, all that stuff. And 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 believe it or not, Sean, there are still there are still uh, I guess you could call them coronavirus skeptics out there who think it's all an act because the government is using it to uh, to seize authority over us and take everyone's guns and stuff. You you heard you heard this kind of stuff? No, not yet. Oh, I I, I hear it all the time. I hear a. Oh no! In fact, I used you as an example the other day when someone's going, "Come on, does anyone really know a person who has a coronavirus? Uh, yep. Does anyone actually know someone I'm like, yep, I do, yep, yep, I've got the video I was telling you the other day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Sean's got it. All right, Sean. Well, um, we will. Uh, we'll. <laughs> Cheryl. <laughs> uh, Cheryl R said, uh, "Where in the world did Dave get that gas mask?" Well, Cheryl, my uh, my oldest son Luke and I have a similar sense of humor. And when everyone started going around wear, <laughs> wearing the little paper masks in his school, it's before school got canceled. Um, but oh. but in in the weeks leading up to uh, to school getting canceled, uh, students and teachers walking around with the masks on. He's like, it's like, can we get a can we get a uh, can we get a, a gas mask so I can go in there and, and kind of uh, <laughs> you know. He's made, he's kind of he's kind of making fun of everyone, right? But um, anyway, I was like, oh, that's a good idea. That's actually funny. So uh, we had to work out a little deal because it's a it's a real gas mask and they're 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 fairly expensive. But uh, so yeah, yeah. That, that's how I ended up with that thing. So that's my son, my son Luke's. Um, all right, so uh, we'll be t we'll, we'll we'll probably uh, we'll probably go about an hour and we'll take uh, we'll take comments and questions along the way, especially uh, questions about uh, coronavirus and so on when we get to that. Uh, but Sean, why don't you tell us, uh, yeah, share, share, share your background for us. Everyone needs to get to know who you are. Thanks brother. I appreciate it. So basically, um, I think good place to start is where I did in my 
when I got saved, about 1994, 95. Shortly thereafter, I got called into the uh, ministry to preach and to be a pastor. So about 96, I started my formal education in theology, and I was very fortunate. The church I was at had a small Bible institute, so I not only was able to study there, but I could intern, do a ton of research. I got to do all kinds of stuff there at the church, unfortunately, including you know funerals and stuff like that, but it gave me a tremendous amount of life experience. After about two years of that, I, I really felt like I had a deficit, so I ended up going off to Bible college, which wasn't a bad thing in terms of what I learned, but I, I really wish I hadn't done it because of all the experience I missed out on if I had stayed where I was at. What I realized was I was actually getting a better education there due to the fact that I was being groomed, you know, such a small class. Um, I was helping out in so many different ways. But fortunately, when I got to the Bible College, which is Trinity Baptist in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, my first semester there, I got hired on as the researcher for the senior pastor, Tom Messer. Messer. Now, that's a me- Trinity is what I would call a mega church. I don't remember what the, you know, the size was at the time, maybe six, 7,000 people. We were running 50 buses on a Sunday to go pick up kids for Sunday school. And so I was sort of the big man on campus in college. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it tells you how nerdy I am, right? <laughs> People are like, oh, it's, it's Pastor Messer's researcher. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, watch out. That, that, hold that door open that, for me. That does sound pretty nerdy. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I was, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping you will eventually get to some information that makes us uh, change our perspective of, uh, of your total utter nerdiness. But, uh, but, but, but go, ahead, go ahead and continue. <laughs> so... Then after that, 9-11 hits, mm. and um, I'm in my, what was it, third, three and a half years in to, to college at this point, about to finish this degree, and unfortunately, um, oh, I'd had two years of law while I was over at, um, over at that, that church I was studying at, too. Those were non-accredited courses, so when I switched over to Trinity, accredited courses, they didn't match, so I had to redo all the theology stuff. My, my law courses were accredited. That'll be pertinent later on. So uh, from there, um, I signed up literally September 12th, 2001. I'm in the recruiter's office. Eric and I, my wife and I had just gotten married in July of that year. So she went from being married to a pastor to being married to a soldier in a few months. Um, from that point, I actually left for basic in, I want to say it was January of, of 2002 because they were, had so many people signing up. They literally couldn't get us in to do the training quick enough. I graduated from all of my schools around May, ended up at Fort Drum, 10th Mountain Division uh, in roughly June of that of 2002. From there, deployed all over the world, uh, predominantly Afghanistan, Iraq, did stuff, all combat missions. I've had almost 400 combat missions over the years, lost friends, of course. Uh, 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 say, say, say that part again. Oh, I, almost 400 combat missions. 400 combat missions? Yes, sir. Yep. All right. Well, you're still here. That's uh, that's pretty good. Yeah. All right. Crashed in that. I've crashed in a helicopter in a minefield uh, that was shot. That we were we were taking small arms fire. We think that's what blew out the transmission of this helicopter, and the pilot, it started going down. So the, I'm praying, and I'm just going, you know, dear Lord God, if I'm Jonah and, and this is the whale moment, please don't kill the rest of these men. I, I'll, I, I, you know, I don't ever make deals with God, but I felt like that was something where I, I just didn't want others to suffer mm-hmm. because I wasn't living right. And um, the pilot set it down in a minefield. He didn't just, like, gracefully set it down. We hit and slid for about 150 meters. Wow. There's a lot that could go wrong. Yeah. Got off the helicopter, tried to dig fighting positions, which is standard procedure, at which point the pickaxe on the helicopter broke. Or we were trying to use bayonets, anything we could to dig into this ground because we knew we had personnel uh, approaching. And so we're breaking tools and stuff. At the time, we get a call over the radio saying, you know, basically stop digging. Do you, do, you, do you hear us? Mm-hmm. So we reply back, yes, we, what's going on? They said, you crash landed in a NATO templated minefield. We didn't realize it because typically in Afghanistan, you'll, what they'll do is they'll, they'll take rocks, they'll paint them white, spray paint them, and put them over where the mines are. And they just stay there. They're just all over the place. Well, we didn't see any of that because when we crash landed, of course, it just scattered everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and so thankfully, the ground was so hard, we couldn't really get anything dug so we had to stay overnight it was pretty cool the French show up in an amphibious vehicle is the most bizarre thing and they're trying to throw us beers David (laughs) of all the supplies we need we need beers and we've got to use their none of us spoke French so we had to use their their Slavic translator who spoke Russian 
and one of our guys spoke Polish, and so they were able to we were able to communicate that way. <laughs> These morons are throwing us beers. We're like, no, 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 stop. But they were super cool. They pulled security around us all night. Mm. Anyway, tons of missions after that. Um, capture lots of high value targets. That's one of the main missions we did. Um, and uh, which high value targets are just bad bad guys that that are up on the you know the most wanted list so to speak. So we're rolling these guys up left and right. I get hurt though repeatedly. Uh, lost hearing in one ear. Uh, I've got fractures in, in my hand. So they said, yeah, you know what? You can ride a desk or we can retire you. And I was like, ah, I'm not riding a desk after doing all this. So that, that was a great time for me to get out. Went back to school. Continued on in, I think, 08. Uh, was ordained as a senior pastor. Or ordained and then became a senior pastor shortly after. Uh, in about two years ago. Sorry about the dog. Go quit. The kids will put him up. That's what, dog, two, that's what dogs are for. Yeah, he's a big one, too, so he's super loud. <laughs> so uh, about two years ago, all my injuries started catching up with me, David. And so um, my wife and I were really wanting to do something in ministry still. But I couldn't I couldn't work in a in pulpit anymore. I was starting to do interim pastoring where I would fill in for guys who were on vacation or for churches who needed, who were searching for pastors. And so we decided to do online ministry. But it took us a while to get started because we weren't really sure if that makes sense, you know, what to do. And uh, it, it sort of dawned on me one day in frustration of noticing that a lot of people weren't really comprehending, like, for instance, the Kalam. They just, they couldn't, it wasn't the shell of it. You know, whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. We'll just do it that way. Simpliciter. But it was because they didn't understand how it could be evidential because it had underlying evidence to support each of those premises, like Craig's had, what, two philosophical arguments and two sets of data for evidence scientific. So they, they weren't understanding these basic concepts of evidence. And so I realized, okay, I think this is it, because I really felt a passion to teach people, whether it's basic philosophy, particularly epistemology, and how that, that really goes into everything we're doing in apologetics and whatnot. And then when we met, that, I gotta give you credit, mixed martial apologetics was your brainchild, and so from there, I, I don't know how many, David was so awesomely patient with me. I'd say, what was the name of that again? And he'd say, Mixed Martial Apologetics. Like <clears throat> half an hour, hour later, I'm like, what was it again? <laughs> but, but by the way, you, by the way, no one ever has to give me credit. I am a nonstop, uh, nonstop uh, fire, fire hydrant of awesome ideas that just come pouring out of me all day. <laughs> yep. You, he is. Seriously. And that's, and, and that's just not just come from me. John over at What Do You Mean was saying that about David. So he's like, man, the guy's got these incredible ideas. So anyway, uh, we took the train with it, and we've been doing videos on there. And now I stopped within the last few weeks because I've been sick with this, uh, the, what I call the vid. Instead of the hiv, it's the vid. Mm -hmm. And so it's just it's been miserable. Now, um, the the reason the reason I suggested mixed martial apologetics was because you were you you were you were talking about yeah. these two different things that what you had a pretty successful martial arts channel before all of this right yep so so what, yeah, yeah. what what's your what's your background in in martial arts that's a great question so I started at the age of six in 1981 so I'll tell you guys you can do the math how old I am and I started in judo originally we moved from up from South Florida when I was about 12 and so I had to switch to karate so Okinawan Shorin Ru and pretty much for most of my life I'd been training in some sort of martial art when I went off to college Trinity uh, up in Jacksonville I started uh, under a man by the name of Lee Peacock in was also Christian great guy in Jun Fan Gung Fu which is Bruce Lee's art and so of course uh, Sam Shamoon and I were talking about that the other day you know he was yeah so, and I've, I've trained under Dan and Asanto for a number of years now, not directly. My teacher, Lee Peacock and others are directly certified under Guru and Asanto. And then I go and travel when he's doing seminars and stuff in the past. Hey, hey great, look, 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 little side note. I think it was, uh, I think it was Danny Asanto. Um, <laughs> uh, I think it was Danny Asanto who said, uh, he, he was, he was asked how Bruce Lee would do against, uh, against, uh, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And he said, uh, in a street fight, he goes. I, I hope they like to practice their jujitsu in Braille. Oh um, yeah, yeah. Yep. He, he said, I, I get it. Yeah. So he said, if it was a street fight, he said the first thing he's going to do is he said Bruce's favorite moves were uh, eye gouge and then stomp and then smash the arch of your foot. He said he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that in the in the movies. But what Bruce would actually do in a in a fight, you know, I'm kind of thinking, you know, because because you kind of think, you know, 
you know, once MMA came along and then people started taking the best out of these different martial arts, the sort of the sort of one dimensional style was kind of obsolete. And so I'm thinking, you know, uh, a modern MMA fighter, um, I think, is just going to, you know, eat someone alive from 20 or 30 yeah. years ago, which is what we saw, which is what we saw when the UFC started. But at the same time, I'm thinking if you're quick enough with an eye gouge and a foot and a foot stomp, that's that's ball game. That's just that, you know, yeah. it doesn't matter. <clears throat> So, yeah, so full disclosure, I've got a black belt in, in jiu-jitsu. Uh, well, I've got a second degree in Japanese jiu-jitsu, but I've also got Brazilian jiu-jitsu certifications, combat submission wrestling under Eric Paulson, because the school I went to had a, it was like a, a, a buffet of, they had all these different instructors. So mm -hmm. I'd go in, on my lunch breaks, I was a manager at a Chick-fil-A while going to school, and I'd uh, hot-foot it over there during my lunch break and go train for an hour every night. Mm -hmm. And so it was, who, whatever class was there is what I jumped into most of the time. And from... And I've been doing that now, those different disciplines for the last, that was 98, 99, so 21, 22 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've been teaching for about 10 years, give or take now, and I've got, I had a channel, Tribe K, and uh, schools, several schools, and um, we wanted to actually use that as a ministry. In fact, at Trinity, I went back and was teaching as outreach um, what we called asymmetrical, as a joke, asymmetrical spiritual warfare. <laughs> so like think special forces, spiritual warfare kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And the idea was using sports, different things as an outreach tool. And so we started out with martial arts and soccer, and we were bringing people onto the church campus because it's 168 acres. And we were using all these different facilities and whatnot to get people onto the campus. And then just trying to, you know, sort of get in their lives, form relationships. And I actually taught a class of college students how to do this sort of stuff and to focus on people and relationships rather because we used to do it the old school way. We'd knock on doors. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just you, we were trying different things. Mm -hmm. So and that's where I started to really blend. That was back in 2007, I think, as a ministry. And then from there, I did that for several years until, again, about the same time I had to step down from the pulpit was about the time like 20 2016 ish mm -hmm. from from that might have been a little sooner because my body just can't can't handle mm -hmm. it from all my injuries so all right well we want to get to coronavirus here in a second i did want to uh, just just uh, uh clarify for everyone uh the difference between your channels uh people might need to refresh uh refresh mm -hmm. the page because i added a link uh after we started so um they might need to refresh their page but um uh, yeah, uh, let me just respond to two quick comments real quick, and, and I'll, I'll try and intersperse some comments as we go. Uh, Sam sure. Samson Rye said, David, how is your brother doing? Uh, that is the great mystery, uh, Samson, because um, they're not... Manny can't exactly communicate very well and doesn't have oh. doesn't really have outside contact, but they don't want people coming and visiting him. So it's kind of a it's kind of a mystery until we're we're because you know we're allowed in there because of the coronavirus. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah. so yeah, I was planning on on making the trek there uh, once or twice a month, and uh, just haven't seen him since the last video I posted. Uh, my, my, fortunately, my other my other brother uh, my other brother John lives closer, so. Um, Marie contacted him earlier and just said, "Hey, you know, do, you know, do whatever you can to find out from whoever's there uh, what, what's going on." And then uh, Niles guy said, "Like the dark background, David. This is not this is not my real um, background. This was uh, recorded the video that I posted right before this started, and given the time of day, the sun was beaming right through right uh, through the window, so I covered it up with uh, with a black backdrop to cover up the sun. So." If you like it, then, you know, love it while it lasts, because it's not going to be here. Um, all right, so uh, your two channels. Go ahead and tell everyone about your two channels real quick, and then we're going to have a little talk about the coronavirus. Nice. Thank you. So the first channel, Believing Thinkers, which is the first one we started, is predominantly a, a – it is apologetic, but it's predominantly a teaching ministry, and it's going to focus on both philosophy of religion and philosophical theology. Now, for those that – aren't sure what the difference is between the two, or at least how I use them, is that typically with philosophy or religion, you're going to see a lot of the arguments for God. And so that's something we're getting into very soon on that channel. We've sort of been setting up for that with some basics of, of, of logic and philosophy so that people, if, if they don't understand that, when we get into it on the channel, we can just point back to the other videos. And that was something we wanted to do because I noticed a lot of people weren't understanding arguments for God because they didn't understand why a deductively, you know, a deductively sound argument, why the conclusion must be true, or just some basic parameters. Then philosophical theology side is literally we'll be approaching theology from with a philosophical standpoint or leaning, 
and uh, talking about divine aseity, talking about all kinds of different topics um, in terms of attributes of God, things like that. In addition, probably some more epistemology stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, because that's that's sort of my my what I'm trying to specialize in. I'm I'm going to back to school for uh, and another master's. I'm working in philosophy on this one at Dr. Hunter's college. And so, um, and then the other channel, Mixed Martial Apologetics, is goofy, fun, apologetic. It's just straight apologetic. Mm -hmm. And it is, I mean, it's silly, bro. When you see it, you're going <laughs> to, if, if you like goofy, silly, it's, it's predominantly geared towards guys. So the difference mm -hmm. between the two is one is very <laughs> astute, if you will, and academic, and the other is very goofy. And so you may not like, if you like one, you may not like the other. Unless you're like me. Yeah, I, I was actually, uh, I've never actually watched an episode of whatever it is, America's Got Talent or whatever, but I, I, I've, I've watched YouTube clips. And, and uh, one of the YouTube clips were, uh, they had two, two, ma two male judges and two female judges. And the, uh, the act was a kind of a martial arts spoof, uh, martial arts comedy yeah. show where this guy's, uh, you know, yep. he, he's, uh, he's got his assistant and stuff like that. And they're running through training and just acting like complete idiots. And Howard Stern and uh, that British dude Simon were were cracking up, dying, yes. and the 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 ladies were just the, the ladies were just going, and they 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 gave they gave the buzzer. They're like, no, get out of here, right? And uh and and Howard Stern gave it like the golden the golden buzzer award where you know they they automatically go through because he thought it was that funny. And so yeah, there's uh there's different yeah. different senses of humor out there. Exactly like that. Mm -hmm. That's exactly who it was geared towards. So yeah, that's the idea. All right, and so uh, the links to uh, the links to those two channels are again in the description box. You again, you might need to refresh your page because I added uh, I added the second link as we we're as we we're kind of starting. Um, all right, well, we wanted to get to coronavirus. By the way, uh, Warrior Warrior Poet Society uh, showed up. I don't know if you guys know Warrior Poet Society, but uh, he's got one of those gun channels, you know, where every video is Aah! Aah! right. And so uh, that's what he does on, on his channel. But, uh, you know, it, it's good because, you know, a lot of people are, you know, a lot of people like those kinds of channels. So, um, I mean, anyone could do it. Anyone could, you know, just, just you know, get some guns and go, oh, I'm going to shoot a bunch of stuff and, and get, you know, get a million views. But he uh, has a very, very popular YouTube channel. Uh, got a couple hundred thousand more subscribers than I do. So that just shows you, uh, that just shows you what people are like, right? You can sit here like me and calmly state facts and give evidence uh, or you can just run around with guns, oh, guns blazing and, uh, you know, people love it. Um, so just keep that in mind. You, you, you know Warrior Poet Society? I don't, but I wrote it down. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to yeah, check no, it out. No, you want to check that out. You, you guys have you guys yeah. have similar backgrounds and stuff. So, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, you want to check that out. Um, all right. So coronavirus. Uh, look, we even have some of the uh, – we even have <laughs> – I'm just, I'm just randomly scrolling through. And let me see. Thomas Watkins here. I believe the coronavirus is the biggest fraud. That has ever been played on the American people. Seven billion people on Earth. One million have the virus. Fifty thousand death. BS. And uh, I've seen uh, multiple comments claiming that this is just uh, just a sort of sort of scam. Which is funny because I mentioned that. I mentioned that as we're starting that there are people who think it's all a hoax. There, 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 there. Likewise, there are people who, um, after every mass shooting, after every mass shooting. Uh, where right. where dozens of people die, they come out and say, "Nope, they're all actors. They're all paid actors. This is a stunt by the government to to seize everyone's guns." And uh, yeah. Jay Warner Wallace, interestingly, he he uh, he, he when he talks about. Uh, so Jay Warner Wallace is a, was a detective and a cold case detective, mm -hmm. and he talks about oh, yeah. yeah he talks about cracking people uh, during interrogations and stuff, and he said that, that the more people you have in a in a conspiracy, the more quickly it breaks down. So the only ones that really last are the ones that are like two or three people who are just completely loyal to each other, like brothers who grew up all their lives and would never, would never, uh, would never snitch on on the other, and so on. He said, uh, other than that, they 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 usually break down under the pro under the uh, under the correct interrogation. And he said, the bigger they get, the quit the more quickly they break down. If you, in other words, if you have 10, 15, he says they're they're always the guys in there who will who will break more quickly. Uh, than others, uh, which is why, which is why it's so ridiculous when you start thinking about, you know, if if uh, if nine eleven is this massive conspiracy and all these yeah. sh all these shootings, you know, all these, I mean, think, uh, you know, the you know, the Sandy Hook massacre and stuff like that. Um, all right. these parents who are in the news, these are all actors, and uh, I, I mean, keep in mind, you know, all the all the students in that school, unless you think the whole school was made up, then there are students in that school. And if you start walking around saying, oh, all these kids are massacred and no one knows, what? Th those kids don't even exist. If you're making all of this up, it you know, 
this has to be a massive, massive, massive conspiracy. And if you're talking coronavirus, and, and you think that all these, you know, all these people who are who are who are sick and dying, and I, I just watched a, a CNN interview with with a uh, um, with a nurse in uh, you know in, in the emergency room in, in New York. She was saying this is mm-hmm. the worst thing I've ever seen. As fast as we're open yep. up opening up new ICUs, we get more people in there. They all have to be ventilated, and we just we're, we're, it, it's. She said this is the worst. This is by far the worst thing she's ever seen in her 20 years as a nurse. And you'll have guys come along. Nope, big conspiracy. It's all a conspiracy. And so, guys, if this is my goodness, how many millions of people do you think do nothing but you know conspiracies all day? Weird stuff. Yeah. But fortunately, we have uh, we have uh, a part of the conspiracy right here. We have Sean, <laughs> who's involved in this conspiracy, trying to convince us that there is such a thing as coronavirus, and he's here. And now we know, thanks to the the the, the gentleman in the uh, in the chat, that that, that Sean is uh, an agent. <laughs> Is an agent uh, who's who's masquerading, masquerading as a Christian, you know, speaker, an apologist, and so on. And he, he's actually he's actually part of the conspiracy, coming in here, coming in here to try and convince us. We should have blacked out my face so that I, you know, you can't see it. Yeah, yeah. I, I can, I can, I can, uh, I can blur it out. Um, I can blur it out later. You got it. all right. Well, um, conspiracy theories aside, although I'll, I'll probably come back to those. Uh, <laughs> Go, go go ahead go ahead and tell us so when did you were, did you get te- yeah, so, did you get tested first or you started like feeling sick or something and then wanted to know no no i started feeling sick first now full disclosure when i was in the army i had not only eight uh combat lifesavers advanced combat lifesavers i then went on to do a trauma triage course and whatnot um even though i wasn't a medic and that's because of the amount of combat so i've got a fair amount of medical training mm-hmm. so I won't get into everything, but because of that, I grew up with a mother as a nurse, uh, healthcare, lots of friends that work in it. Pretty good understanding of, of how sicknesses work. Um, and so we actually isolated ourselves mm-hmm. before this. When, when when we got back in February from the event, I was I was the only moron on a on an airplane at the time wearing an N95 mask. Mm. So I start we started isolating ourselves. And I won't get into how and we're able to to do all this, but. Um, We've been ordering groceries and stuff, so I know that's how it came through into the house. Because groceries. by this time, groceries or the person who was making the delivery, and it was a very brief. I mean, think about that. It's a very brief contact um, because they were literally just bringing the bags up. We're you know we're bringing them in. It could have been somebody who stocked the stuff. It could have been any number of ways, but we know that that's how it got into the house. Because mm. prior to me being sick, it had been almost a month we had been isolated at home, um, and we did that partly because we also homeschool our children. And so because of that, we tend to, if we go to my brother's house for a holiday, we always get sick inevitably because our kids don't have the same immunity because they're not in public school. So that being said, um, about two weeks ago, yeah, I started feeling feverish and it was pretty normal. And I had this terrible headache uh, right between the eyes. Now I take pain medicine for my back. So I know when that's not cutting it, it's bad. So... um, at any rate, I went ahead and took some Tylenol, and that seemed to manage it a little bit, but the fever felt different, and, and that makes sense when you think back on it, because the reason it's the novel coronavirus is humans haven't had this yet. So it's a, it's a, so, you've been sick before, and you're saying this was a different kind of feeling than you had experienced before. Yes, I've, I've had um, bronch, or I'm sorry, I've had, um, not bronchitis, but um, pneumonia, pneumonia mm-hmm. twice, twice, and so, and so, and this is similar to that, and so when you, but not in the way it felt. And so from the fever and that, it was typically just sort of flu-like symptoms, but I was suspicious because of all this going on, but I still waited to get tested until the, t- the tightness in the chest. That I have not felt the same way when I had pneumonia. I, I mean, I had different respiratory issues, but this was wholly different. It was like somebody had, you know, was compressing my chest just sitting on here laughing with you now, my mm-hmm. sternum, I could feel a little bit of that tightness here again. And the coughing a little bit, but for me anyway, that could be due to medication. There's, I don't know why I didn't have as much of that. So I did first a face-to-face consult, actually through um, Skype with a doctor, because they don't want you coming in. If you are sick and infecting people, you know, they, they, they want to first sort of weed you out. And they said, yeah, we, you know, we're pretty confident you have it. Mm. Um and so at that point, based on all this, the, symptom, the symptoms, and I'm 
I get into how I know I'm, I can do my blood pressure here at the house due to my medical training, you know, got thermometers, the, the, the works. So at any rate, he, he was pretty confident. And then I said, well, I feel like I still need to get tested, tested. So I started isolating myself down in my office. I've been living in here mm -hmm. for the last two weeks. I haven't, I barely left. I do if, if I went into the, um, cause my wife's pregnant and I don't want to make her sick. And we've got a two-year-old too, that which worries me. Although it seems that young children aren't getting this right now, so um, thankfully, uh, you, you know that's the case. But two of my daughters were pretty sure have it. Um, at that point, I didn't bother having them tested. I went ahead and got tested, and yeah, you've got it. All right, fine. So I just been sleeping on an air mattress here in the office and isolating myself. I also use there's a um, diffuser. It's an alcohol lamp which actually will emit alcohol, burning alcohol into the air, which is great for sterilizing the air. They used to use them in hospital ERs uh, years, long, long time ago. So I use that uh, HEPA filter in here to sort of isolate, if that makes sense, anything in the office, any germs that are in here, so it's not spreading. And so far that's worked. If I leave the, the, um, the room, I wear an N95 mask. And then I also wash with HIBA cleanse, which I'm not sure if, if your viewers are familiar with. When, the, when, when SARS was popular and when the flu comes around every year sometimes people will, will run out and, and stock up on that think of hippoclens like a hospital grade antiseptic that works on your skin for like 12 hours killing germs so that helps and so far i haven't contaminated anyone else in the house i think the girls got it unfortunately before i realized i was sick mm -hmm. so but the the pain in the chest the, the respiratory issue was the one that terrified me because i woke up one night i think i told you this before gasping for air and that scared me to death. That was thankfully the worst of it. And so from then, that was the high point of, you know, how bad it was. And from there, thankfully, the next morning I told myself, this gets any worse. I'm, that's it. I'm in the ER because I'm in my, I'm, I'm 45. So mm -hmm. I was a little concerned with my, at my age that, that I could be susceptible to death in this. Um, but yeah, and I have friends that work up at NYPD and they're seeing it. They're seeing the outcome up in hospitals up there. Um, I have a good dear friend, a junior, who we work together with Tribe K. Um, and so, yeah, I, I've not just personal experience, but I, I, I'm hearing from friends that are working um, in law enforcement or, or as EMTs and whatnot, and they're saying they're, they're seeing the results of this. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I'll, I'll make this last point here, too, about that, is that there were doctors that were getting out on you, on Facebook initially saying, oh, the, the flu kills more people, and I'm going... I wish you wouldn't say that, no. you know, because we don't know, we don't, we don't have the statistical data. And I kept seeing this comparison and, and I know you ha uh, have ex yeah. training in. Yeah. Well, the, the, the most com the most common one I, I was seeing right when it was starting was, oh, but the flu has killed far more people and the cold has killed far more people. And I was going, well, yeah, they've spread all over the world for, for a long, long time. This, this right, just started, right? To it. Yeah. They, I mean, this, this just started. I mean, in other words, we've all had the flu. We've all had colds. And so right. it could get, very few of us, a very small portion of the world's population have had coronavirus. Exactly. And so you're looking at the actual uh, mortality rates. In other words, out of the people who get this, how many of them actually die? And, and it's way higher than it is for, for the colds. Not, the cold's not even in the, in the running, but massively higher than, than the exactly. flu as well. And, and the problem, too, that I'm, I keep seeing, and, and you, you've got training in formal epistemology with Bayesian you know, probability theorem, but I kept seeing people say, we have X number dead and X number have it. And I'm like, no, the habits are indeterminate. You want to compare yeah. dead to, to recovered. Mm -hmm. Because if yeah. you're going dead to, to have it, to ha you know, we don't know whether the habit are going to recover or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, far more will, but you know, it's, it's still too early on to make those determinations. And then the same doctors that were on Facebook you know, saying, ah, no big deal. A lot of them have come back and reversed their position saying, oh my goodness, once I started seeing patients with this, because you don't, you typically die from the flu, you die from complications. Mm -hmm. You do actually die from the, well, sort of die from coronavirus. It is different. Mm -hmm. Let me be careful there. Granted, yeah, not everyone that has it. There's some people that, like my two daughters, you wouldn't have, you know, had I not been confirmed, I would have just thought they had a flu. Now, the other thing though, is that it, it did linger in them a lot longer. That's mm -hmm. something that I've noticed with this. So it, what were the, what were the s symptoms like with your daughters? Um, they're same thing. So our, with all of us, it was upset stomach, but not not like a horrible upset stomach. Loss of taste and smell. That was one that I, mm -hmm. I did. We did have as well. Um, there was the headache, right? Sort of almost like a sinus headache, which is why initially I thought, ah, oh, this is the flu. 
the fever was different in the sense that it was a fever, but I mean, it, it felt, you ever taken a, a workout supplement that had like niacin in it, almost made your skin, for me, almost make your skin like tingly, itchy, burning, it was like that to me. Now, I don't know if it just was because the fever was high or what, but it, it, it did feel different and the chest, um, the the tightness in the chest was different as well. Typically with, with a pneumonia, I had almost a rattly cough by the time I felt that, it was a wet sort of thing. This was this is more of a, a, a an extreme pressure, if you will. Mm -hmm. Now it may be different. Again, some people may have milder versions, and you're going to need to look at what the doctors are saying in mm -hmm. terms of you know categorically what they know. That's the problem because this is novel. They're not sure yeah. what. And know. and and that and that's actually uh, that's actually part of the problem is uh, that's why this disease spreads so rapidly is that lots of people have mild symptoms. If people had much worse symptoms, you get it and you just start coughing up blood and stuff like that. It's yeah. much easier to spot. Yeah. But because because so, ma so many people have mild symptoms, they just think that it's a cold or another flu or something like that. Or some people just, you know, uh, hey, I have a little bit of an ups upset stomach or something like that. And in the meantime, they spend the next two weeks infecting people with with the disease, uh, going around infecting people because they, they have no idea that they that they have it. So, yeah, it's kind yeah. it's kind of it's kind of in that range where it's uh, it's bad enough to have a, a a fairly high mortality rate, but it would almost be better if it had a a much more a much higher mortality rate in the sense that if people could spot it, if the symptoms were much more dramatic. Uh, then you could spot right. it easier. You could spot it more easily, and it wouldn't be it wouldn't be infecting uh, infecting so much people. So, yeah, pretty uh, pretty creepy stuff. Yeah, and uh, uh, with with the uh, with the mortality rate, because you know if you, I was constantly doing the numbers when the numbers are released uh, mm -hmm. from various places, whether it's you know Italy or Korea or any of these places, China and so on, and then in the U.S. Looking at here's the number of here are the number of people who are infected. Here are the number of people who've who've tested positive, and here are the number of people who died. And just doing the math was getting between two and ten percent on in, in the area, two and ten percent mortality rate. And then it was always being suggested, well, that that that's not the that isn't necessarily the correct mortality rate because it doesn't take into account all the people who have it but but don't know they have it. And mm -hmm. so they're not being, they haven't been, they haven't been, been tested for it. Um, and uh, yeah, recently I, was, I was, uh, saw a doctor who was saying, you know, if you go with the sort of, uh, sort of highest amount of people that we think might actually have it and the people who've, who've died so, so far, you're still at a mortality rate of about 0.6%. Point, which is still massively higher than, than something, yeah. than something like the flu. I mean, if, I mean, think, you know, if my kid's got a, like uh, 2,000 kids, 2,000 kids in, in his school, um, if 2,000 kids got it and, and that mortality rate held up, now I understand, you know, depending on your age and so on, it, it could be different, but, uh, uh, you know, right. you'd be talking about 12 dead kids in, in the school. You're, you're not, you, don't, you don't see that from the flu. It's very rare to have, you know, someone in, in your school die from the, the, the flu or something like that. And so, yeah, if it were, if you had that high a mortality rate from the cold or from the flu, people would be quarantining over, over the cold and the flu. Yeah. It would be considered much, well, much more dangerous. Yeah, and there, there's other things I, I looked at. I'd gotten a world... Um, map i don't know where it is right now i'd share it with you but I, I don't know where it is on my desktop where it showed the median age or the ages in in every country in on the globe and what was interesting is all the countries that had a higher median age had a higher death rate italy spain i mean you name it it, it was it tracked now I, I realize correlation does not imply causation but in addition to that seems to be the case that when they when the and this makes sense with with the amount of ventilators that need to be used mm -hmm. for this because of what it's doing to the lungs that w once the medical system gets overwhelmed that seems to be when the death rate spikes so you've got a combination of things going on there almost a perfect storm if you've got a you know a not as good of an infrastructure medically and you don't know what you need yeah and all of a sudden now you've got to ramp up production of ventilators see the u.s we've, we've been able to prep for it from what we've seen happening other places first mm -hmm. but yeah it's it's it spreads like wildfire Mm -hmm. I mean, think about the limited contact, and I know what we, how limited our contact was with that person because I had, was already suspicious of everyone bringing deliveries. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and uh, of course, there's, uh, you know, you've got you've got quarantining and and 
you know, I, I kind of get it when people say, come on, you know, just let it run its course and, and so on. Uh, but the, the idea behind the quarantining is just to slow it, just to slow it down because of that, Correct. because you don't have the respirators. Correct. Um, Correct. And so. And the, yep. Yeah. So and the, and the and the vaccines and all that other stuff. That's right. Just trying to buy time so we can mm -hmm. have those kind of things. That's right. Yeah. Um. One second. Yeah. You have uh. You have vitamin C. You have uh, vitamin Z in there. Um. Saying, uh. But but twenty. What do he say? But twenty to fifty thousand people. Uh. Tw he says twenty to fifteen. Twenty to fifty thousand people die from the flu in the U.S. each season. Yeah. Do the math. Calculate how many people actually get the flu. Calculate how many people actually get the flu because we don't quarantine over the flu and tons right. and tons and millions and millions and millions of people get the flu each year. And then you have the people who actually die from it and you do the math and you get the mortality rate and it's less right. than 0.1 of 1%. Hence, that's right. It's between. Yeah. That's right. Hence, hence the the best case scenario right when they're saying if we if we go with the highest numbers of the people we think might be infected not people who've been tested just the highest number of, of people we think might be positive for it and we just factor in the deaths there and notice you're still not getting the mortality rate because there are lots of people who have it but haven't died and we don't know if they're going to die yet right they might die tomorrow they might die a week from now if you just factor right. in the deaths and the amount of people who might possibly have this disease you're getting a mortality rate of about point, uh, 0.6 of a percent so you're already massively higher than you are for the flu and again, that's best case scenario. If you just if you just look at the actual statistics of the people that, that we know have it, and the uh, the amount of people who die, you're getting number you're getting numbers like between again between two and ten percent, depending on on, on the the uh, the average age in the country. Yeah. So, dude, if you're gonna sit here and, and pretend like this is the same thing, dude, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna have to regard you as someone who's who's basically you know, it's like like you yeah. guys are the problem, right? You guys are the problem. And, um, and that's because they don't take it seriously they end up uh, shredding it one second one second sean one second sean looks like you got a little uh connectivity problem right now everything you just said was garbled so that normally resolves itself after a couple seconds that just happens okay. just so you know that's 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 total that's totally normal unless you have top-notch internet like i do uh but go ahead i think <laughs> i think you're good now okay sorry about that so um yeah that's the problem is that when people don't take it seriously they may be fine from it that's mm -hmm. not the issue. The issue is who they're going to infect and spread it to that may not be people with underlying conditions. I think the new estimate, whatever he just quoted, 40,000 a year annually from the flu. Okay, but they're now estimating this at the low end at 100,000. Mm -hmm. So that's well over. The, the difference is staggering. And that, that and that's that, on the low yeah, end. Yeah, and that's with every precaution we can take and quarantining and everyone social distancing yep. and everyone walking around exactly. wiping. I, I, I'm bringing I'm bringing sterile wipes kind of wherever I go. And again, guys. That 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 sort of mentality of, oh come on, it's it's uh, chances are I'm gonna be fine. That's my mentality, right? I'm like, go ahead, give me give me coronavirus, let me get it over with. I got a problem, namely I have to, uh, two of my two of my sons are on respirators, and so if they get That's it, right. they're in a they're. It, come on, they're they're already on respirators. If all of a sudden they get coronavirus, uh, as well. Chances are, uh, those are going to be there's going to be pretty big problems there. So that's why that's why I'm uh, that's why I'm trying to be as careful as I can. But yeah, so I, I just go around yeah. and when I when I need to get gas or something like that, I break out the sterile wipes. I I've, I've thought about making a little uh, little video called the sterilizer, but uh, I just walk around wiping down you know gas pumps and and uh, and door handles everywhere, and stores and stuff like that. And so uh, yeah, but guys, so so. <laughs> The, yeah, so the idea here is this is a disease that is uh, if if you're not doing the social distance because that that's that's one of the main objections they're just causing mass hysteria. I don't know we're we're not hysterical. You got a couple people get a little yeah. hysterical over finding toilet paper or something like that. But overall, people are being pretty calm. They're I, I mean if you think mass hysteria is like washing door handles and and you know staying six feet away from people, I you know I'd hate to see you, you, what you think when you see actual mass hysteria because the idea here is even if we are even if you really can't stop it, even if you really can't stop this and it's going to infect us all, it's much better if this happens over a significant period of time. One because you know treatments are going to become more effective as time goes on and they're working on they're working on more and more effective treatments and so on uh but also uh hospitals would be overwhelmed very very rapidly right i mean i mean imagine yep. 
if 300 if, if if 300 million people got the coronavirus oh, l- matter of fact let's just l- let's not go that high let's say 100 million people got coronavirus yeah. over the next month so a little you know uh, less than a third of the world of, of the population of the US if 100 million people got coronavirus in the US uh, they they estimate that about 15% of people who get coronavirus need to be hospitalized over it. So some people are fine. Some people just need to say stay home, you know, act like they got the flu and stuff and, and so on. But about 15% need to be hospitalized. Tons of people need respirators. You don't have you don't have you don't have right. 15 million hospital beds with in respirators and so on. you don't have anywhere near that. A, a, a respirator is a fairly rare piece of equipment. This very it's rare for people to need it. My kids need it. We have them and so on. But these aren't things that you you, you just have millions of these things uh, laying around. And so you you kind of you, you try to slow the disease down. You try to slow the disease down to save lives. And if you're not in favor of slowing a disease down to save lives, you, I kind of regard you as a as a as a creep and a weirdo. All right. Yeah. So, and I think if we if we look at this logically, right, um, think of it this way. Why would a president who prides himself on the economy being as high as it ever was tank it unintentionally? Trump, what would be Trump wants to take your guns, <laughs> oh, which they haven't started to do, at least not where I'm at. Of course, I'm in the gun sh- gun shine state, so I'm good there. But at any rate, you know, it just doesn't make any sense to tank the economy and then give out all of that money. I, I mean, it just, I don't, I don't understand why that doesn't logically follow to me. Um, unless, I mean, maybe I'm not wearing my tinfoil hat today. And so it just doesn't make sense, but I, I don't get it. Yeah. That, that's, that's like, that's like most conspiracy theories, right? Like the one I heard from, from Muslims and, and some others, even some non-Muslims, uh, all, you know, for the years was, you know, about, about nine yeah. eleven, And so this was a government, oh, yeah. this was a government attack on our economic capital, <laughs> on our economic capital because they wanted to blame Muslims so that they could go over there and steal the oil. Well, great. If, if that was the pl- one, I mean, think about the number of people who would need to be involved in that conspiracy Two, think about, okay, if this was all a conspiracy under George Bush, you telling me later leaders who came along and, and would love to expose these guys just didn't do it. Right. So who, so who's doing it and who, who is it that that's not exposing it, who has every reason to expose it. Um, but, but even then, Really, that was the plan because how well did that work out, right? Right. Oh yeah, you yeah. went in there, and I don't know, if, I don't know if anyone noticed, but the the price of gas got got pretty bad for for a for a long, long time. So what 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 exactly did we get out of the deal? We got all that, and then of course you you ended up in a in an endless war. What it, what was it? Almost a twenty year war in Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, tons of money lost. Can't can't even. I mean, gosh, how much money was lost on on all of that? If that was a was a was some conspiracy, yeah. man, that was the dumbest thing of all time. And you would just expect someone to come forward and say, "Man, I got the documents right here. That is the stupidest thing we've ever done. Let me explain why, so that we never do right. this again." Yeah. 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 Not to mention, I don't recall seeing any oil fields when I was in Afghanistan. But I know, I know somebody will, rare earth, you know, rare earth minerals, whatever. Again, you can't mine them in these areas, guys. You can't. This it's a it's a perpetual war zone all the time. Yeah. Uh, all right. Hang on. We have a. Uh, this was this was earlier, but. Uh, yeah, I haven't I haven't been paying attention to the uh, to the chat too much, but uh, here you have a here you have a this is totally off topic, um, but some people just love to go off topic. But Ikram Niazi said, "Quran is the only word of God, in which God directly speaks in first person speech, unlike Bible or other books where God is quoted by third person, like God said this, Jesus said this, blah blah." So. He's saying here you have first person speech. Now, to be clear, you have tons of first person speech um, in the Bible. But if he's saying yeah. if he's saying that this is the prize characteristic of the Quran, let me go ahead and read the first surah of the Quran, Surah Al Fatiha. And so it says, verse starting at verse one, in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, praise be to Allah, Lord of worlds, the beneficent, the merciful, master of the day of judgment, thee alone we worship. Thee alone we ask for help. Show us the straight path, the path of those whom thou hast favored, not the path of those who earn thine anger, nor of those who go astray. Now, here's what's interesting, Ikram. You're saying this is first person. You just said it. You said it right there. The Quran is first person. So, if this is first person, then this is Allah speaking. This is Allah speaking. 
right? This is not us speaking to Allah. This is Allah speaking to us. It's first person, right? Well, what does Allah say? Allah says, in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, praise be to Allah, Lord of worlds. So he's, he's, he's saying, he's praising himself, the beneficent, the merciful, master of the day of judgment, the alone we worship. So wait a minute, Allah is talking to another Allah because he says, thee alone do we worship, thee alone do we ask for help. If this is first person, then Allah is 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 saying he worships someone else and he's saying he's asking someone else for help. And then he asks, Allah asks, oh my goodness, Allah says, show us the straight path. So one, you've got Allah and someone else. Who's he talking about? The angels? Allah is speaking to someone to someone else and ask and praying to that other Allah, saying, uh, please help me, please help me, show me the straight path. Allah's begging for help for the straight path. And then he says, The path of the the path of those on whom thou hast favored, not of those who've earned your anger. So my goodness, now you've just admitted that Islam is polytheistic and that the God, the first person God of the Quran, the God who is speaking in the Quran, actually has another God that he prays to and he prays for this God to guide him on the straight path. Wow, Ikram, boy, I'm really interested in your polytheistic religion. Now, say you're sorry or <laughs> I might have to make a video on this. All right, all right, back to you, back to you. All right, we got about ten more minutes. Um, I'll just turn it over for uh, questions now. If anyone have uh, uh, any questions for Sean or questions about coronavirus, now is the time. There's too many here for me to actually go through them all, so I'm just skipping them all the way down here. And if you have any questions, uh, doesn't ha it doesn't have to be about coronavirus. If you have any uh, yeah. questions about anything else um, that Sean said or apologetics or anything like that, I'm happy to look at those right now. Um, yeah, specializing. Uh, Oh, uh, now, 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 now people are uh, now people now people are looking at uh, <laughs> now people are are making fun of Islam for being polytheistic. See what you did, Ikram. <laughs> see what you did. You see this? Poor guy. All right. What were you going to say that uh, are you, you're about to say your areas of specialty? Oh, I just yeah, as you can say, I specialize in epistemology of, of uh, religion. That's my my coin that. But mm -hmm. yeah, epistemology as far as with apologetics and whatnot, and and. Uh, Oh, hey, uh, now, now Fahim tries to uh, go tries to go in there and rescue Ikram. Fahim says, David, what Allah in Surah Al-Fatiha is teaching on how to pray. This what us Muslims have to say. Uh, wrong. Fahim, throughout the rest of the Quran, whenever Allah is telling you to say something, what does he say? He says, say. He says, oh, you believe, say this. Or you, Muhammad, say this. Surah Al-Fatiha does not have say in it. So there's no, this is what you guys need to say. So he's not talking to someone else, but here's the problem, right? So this is the eternal speech of Allah, right? This is the eternal word of Allah, the eternal speech of Allah. So from all eternity, in other passages, Allah is from all eternity reciting, say this, say that. So he just knows one day he's going to show up and, and tell people, you know, say this, say that, okay? But in Surah Al-Fatiha, there's no say. There's no, there's no say. It's just, uh, it's just, oh, Allah, we praise you and so on. So from all eternity, Allah is saying this. This is Allah's eternal speech. He's saying pray. He's saying guide me. He's saying lead me on the straight path. So Allah says this from all eternity. There's not one word in Surah Al-Fatiha saying this is what you Muslims should pray. This is just Allah saying it from all eternity. And you got a problem there. Fahim, I'm not the one, I'm not the one who said this is, this is all first person. You guys said it's first person. And you guys use this to, to, to trump the Bible. Now you're saying, oh, no, 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 that's not first person. This is Allah uh, telling us how we're supposed to pray. But he forgot to say that this is this is this is what I'm telling you guys to say. There's not one word in there about this is what you guys say. There's nothing about that. Um, so Allah just messed that part up. You guys said it's all first person. That's, you guys said it. That, that, yeah, to, to use a little logic here. Fahim, is that who it is? Uh, this is Fahim, just, and Fahim, to be he, to be clear, Fahim isn't the one who made the claim earlier. That oh, was okay, that was okay, that was Ikram, okay. so we wouldn't hold him responsible. Okay. But okay. he's he's Fahim saying this is Allah. He's saying this is Allah teaching us how to pray. But by the way, a little side note, Fahim, that's one of the reasons. That's one of the reasons that Ubay ibn Kaab, I mean not Ubay ibn Kaab, um, uh, Ibn Masud said that this isn't supposed to be part of the Quran, right? He's saying the Quran, and this is this is a. <laughs> Modern Muslims today, there are uh, the, the group that's called Quran only Muslims. They don't believe that this is supposed to be in the Quran, right? They say the Quran is Allah speaking to us. Fatiha is is us speaking to Allah. If this, if okay. if the Quran is Allah's speech to us, then that means Allah's praying, and we, Allah can't be praying. Right. So they reject that as part of the Quran, right? Uh, Ibn Masud, 
Ibn Masud said, this is not supposed to be part of the Quran. This is our prayer. By the way, he also said Surah 113 and Surah 114 are not supposed to be in the Quran because these are prayers, right? These are, these are, these are all prayers. And so, and you might say, well, who cares what Ibn Masud say? Problem is your prophet said, if you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from Ibn Masud. So the guy that your prophet said to learn the Quran from said that the Quran you've got today is wrong. It contains chapters that are not supposed to be in the Quran, right? And so you got two you got two possibilities. If you say no, we have the correct Quran, then Ibn Masud was wrong and Muhammad was wrong about the guy you should go to. Muhammad didn't even know who who you should go to to learn the Quran. Uh, to learn the Quran from. Uh, or you can say, nope, Muhammad does know what's supposed to be in the Quran. So two, he would know whom you should go to. And he said, go to go to Ibn Masud. And Ibn Masud says, all right, we need to take three chapters out of the Quran. Um, I've got a Quran right here. If you want to come and rip these chapters out to be in, align, uh, to be in, uh, in alignment with your prophet, um, you're welcome to do that. All right, let's see if we have some questions. Because say, guys, we try to have a nice conversation. Try to talk about coronavirus. The dudes can't stop. They can't stop, right? It's like, let's just keep blurting out stuff that has nothing to do with anything we're talking yeah. about. Just so, because, I mean, they're almost like plants, right? You might think they're like Christian yeah. Christians that have been planted here to make Islam look bad and get me to start going after <laughs> going, yeah. a, going yeah. after Islam. And it sounded like contradictory. I didn't realize it was two people because the one says all, all are a universal statement and one makes a... A universal affirmative and the other makes a particular negative well no that's a direct contradiction guys you can't say all verses are this and then some are not mm -hmm. that it that no that can't work mm -hmm. so <laughs> and then we have uh and then we have uh hayden tang says uh you say allah prays but you forget allah prays for muhammad not to muhammad <laughs> so don't ever forget that everyone um if anyone tells so, you that Allah prays to Muhammad, he's wrong. That's why you. So that's better. Hmm? So, so, praying for, so Allah needing to pray. No, 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 for no, Muhammad no. no it, it's it's a joke. I, I was having a debate. Oh. I was having a debate with a Muslim, and I said, according to the Quran, Allah prays for Muhammad. That's what I said. I said it repeatedly. Allah prays for Muhammad. Right, and uh, right, right. then when the Muslim got up, he says, okay, well, David says that Allah prays to Muhammad, something I never said. I've never said once in my entire life. He says, uh, 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 he says, uh, uh, David says that Allah prays to Muhammad, but I'm going to have to give him an Arabic lesson. The Muslims start laughing and cheering and stuff. Oh, and then he I says, yeah. And then he says, and then he says, so it's Allah prays for Muhammad, not to Muhammad. And the crowd burst into the Muslim crowd burst into tears. Yay. You've destroyed David. And all he did was confirm exactly what I said about the Quran. So this is just amazing stuff. So anyway, that's kind of, that's kind of the, uh, Brilliant. Uh, that's kind of the joke right here. Um, all right. So let's, uh, let me just click on these rapid fire. Benjamin Handelman said, uh, how big a fan of David Wood is Sean. He has been in la He's been laughing the whole time. <laughs> I love David. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, 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 so you're the one, <laughs> uh, John Beaver said, Sean, did you get it from the package itself or the delivery person? Not sure. I wish I could say for certain. I had very limited contact with the person. I mean, we didn't like actually touch hands or anything. They were literally handing me the bags and I was carrying them in. So, mm -hmm. I, I, so it's, it's, I it's, know. it's basically, there was no way for it to get in except that delivery and so it could be the guy or could be could be something right. in the package so the, in, in other words right. the concern i mean obviously if a person has coronavirus and he hands you your package he's getting it on the package i think the concern is right. that even if that dude doesn't have it if he brings you a bag but you know a pack of ramen noodles was contaminated because someone else right. someone at the ramen no ramen noodle factory contaminated it and then you're just handing groceries in which case everyone's going right. to be freaking out about the groceries themselves or, yeah or the stock person or the, you know, the bag boy or bag girl, bag person, you know, the cash cashier, whoever. Yeah, anyone that's coming in contact. Now, they are saying that they don't think it lives on cardboard for longer than, I think, a day now, where they were saying, I think, something like nine days. On yeah, so, uh, yeah I've, I've, seen, I've seen different estimates, but I've seen five and, and so on. Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> Uh, we had a we had a couple we have a couple a couple comments along the lines of uh, uh, treatment. So Emma Emma said, "What do you take at home to treat it?" And uh, Tech thirteen o two said, uh, uh, "Did you take any medicine for it, like an, uh, like vit yes. vitamins or antiviral?" So great questions. Unfortunately, don't have any antivirals. I wish I did. I don't know. Of course, you know I don't know what that would have done. We assume if you know enough about antivirals to ask that that you probably know enough. It, in theory, I guess it could. I did take, I have um, 
amoxicillin and uh, do I have doxycycline too here at the house? And so I was taking that, and that I think is probably what kept me out of the ER. Mm -hmm. Now this wasn't um, this was left over from a um, cavity I had filled, and so I just save that stuff when I get it. I know if there's MDs in the house, oh you shouldn't do that. You're supposed to throw it away. Yeah, how many people actually do that, guys? All right, whatever. But but. Um, in addition, then I actually started on vitamin C um, that was waiting on it. I had ordered it, and of course they were out like toilet paper and everything else. Finally showed up about four days ago. I started taking it, and that seemed to make a huge difference. And I've been eating fresh fruits, um, grapefruits, oranges, whatever we can get, but of course it's in limited supply. So that did seem to help. Otherwise, I ate fairly normal, but Erica, my wife, keeps me pretty healthy. She's very good about feeding me healthy stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Um, now, Nuxa says, uh, now that Sean has recovered, he doesn't have to worry about getting coronavirus. Praise God for that. Is that correct? Amen. Because I've heard conflicting uh, info uh, on that. Correct. So it seems to be the case that you can get it again. There seems to be a reoccurrence, and it's possible that, uh, yeah, uh, that, I, I don't know for certain. So let me be careful, Nuxa. That's a great question or uh, thought, statement, however you want to look at it. And I, I'm not certain that's the case. If it if anything, you can get it again, and this may actually potentially end up being a seasonal thing for all of us. But again, once the vaccine's there and the medicines are available to everyone, it won't be such a big deal. Not to mention, hopefully, immunity to it, where it won't be so novel. Uh, you've already kind of you've kind of touched on this, but uh, just just to be clear on it, uh, Tatiana is asking: Is he fully recovered now? And and the daughters. Uh, so, what's it looking like? So for me, I am not fully recovered, and the and the daughters are a few days behind me we are all at the turning point where we're feeling a lot better. So in terms of like the, I think uh, yesterday was the first day I told my wife I felt human. I mean, like my chest wasn't just So y yesterday was where th you had kind of a, a, a turning point. Yeah. Uh, and before that, I could feel it going down. But yesterday, the pain in my chest, and I say pain more like discomfort, I guess, stopped. And so that was really a big, a big, a big deal. And then today, until David was making me laugh, my chest was... <laughs> okay, but yeah, you guys have no idea how good of a guy David is, and uh, uh, he's a good friend to a lot of us. You got that right. I think I think Benjamin Handelman. I think I know who that is. He's joking around. Oh yeah. But, yeah. Um, you have a uh, oh here's here's one from Fred Sanford. Now I don't know to what extent you are an expert on this. I'm imagining that once you started realizing you have it, you probably have been doing a lot of reading and so on. Uh, but Fred Sanford, yes, the Fred Sanford, uh, said, que said, question for Sean, what do you recommend for those of us who are older and more vulnerable? Thank God for my son Lamont, who is helping me out. <laughs> so, so what I would suggest, Fred, is, um, first of all, if you can get Hibiclens do that. Now, I know some MDs say, well, we don't know. Yeah, all right, fair enough. But it's it's just soap that's going to work. Um, and, and what you'd want to do is wash from about hand and elbow like a surgeon would preparing. And that way, you know, hopefully it will help kill the virus if it comes in contact with you once a day. It should be more than enough. Uh, in fact, you don't want to overuse it. And the reason why is you can actually lower your body's uh, immunity. But if you're susceptible now, I'm talking about, okay, uh, if you if if you have if you really do have a son um, or daughter, you know, or, or loved one that's leaving the house a lot and coming home as much as is possible, have them not right on the front doorstep, but have them go straight to the bathroom, strip down, shower off. You know, it, that, those types of, of things can can help dramatically if you can not isolate yourself in, in your home. If that's the case where you do have family members coming and going, that can that can definitely help. I mean, we have five children and my wife and I, so that we're a fairly large family. And I was able to keep the rest of the family from getting it other than the two daughters. Of course, we didn't know they had it because I was already sick when, when I found out they, I was just getting sick when we found out they were. So um, that was the unfortunate side. Uh, in addition to that, um, you just try to you know eat healthy, drink water, and, and just try to isolate yourself. I mean, that's it. Now, if you can get, apparently, and I, again, I'm not an MD, talk to your doctor. Call them and ask. They're suspecting that the malaria drug combined with the Z-Pack, even just the malaria drug, may be a prophylactic. And for those of you who, at the grade school humor level, uh, like David and I, that prophylactic there just means you know preventative. Okay, so you can take that, and they think. But again, talk to your doctor because I'm not an MD. I just play one on TV. So, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, finding truth, and. Uh... 
finding truth. You were on you 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 were in the you were in the comments uh, the other day with uh, with Braxton Hunter, right? Is that is, is that because uh, I, I, I hmm? no uh, me uh, fi oh, no fi truth. finding truth here? Uh, but he said, are oh you, yeah 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 yeah. Uh, he said, but are you guys aware of some of the videos about what's happening in Ecuador? If true, dead people are being set on fire in the streets. That wouldn't. Wow, that's scary and sad. Um, it's interesting because what I've noticed is all the communist countries are reporting very low. You look at Russia, um, I know Cuba, you might argue socialist, whatever, but, but a lot of these where they have stricter governments, let's just say it that way, are reporting very low numbers, even in including some South American countries. But no, I wasn't aware of that. I actually have a neighbor who's from Ecuador. Uh, I don't think Manny will talk to me right now, but when he's he seen me walking around with the mask, but once I'm better, I'll have to ask him. But no, I, I mean, and I don't know where, you know, where that's coming from, but mm -hmm. wow. Um, uh, Phil asks this is a question for me. Do you think Hodge 2020 will still occur this year? No, I don't. Uh, mm. Nope, I do not believe that it will happen. You might, you might have some Muslims rebel and want to do it anyway, but I believe that uh, I believe that the Saudi government will not allow it, and that they'll start arresting people, mass arresting people if they uh, if they need to. So I think they'll put soldiers out there if they need to. Did I, did you do a video on where the the uh, yeah you did where the Muslim cleric or whoever it was was coming out and saying that the coronavirus was the death of it, the angel of death and only it's calling it a soldier of Allah soldier oh, of yeah. Allah that's mm -hmm. what it was yeah and saying that only yeah. I'm like does he realize that we get news about Iran that are there no Muslims in Iran anymore like yeah. they had a lot of dead there I don't understand well he, he, that 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 dude is 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 hardcore Sunni who doesn't believe they're real. Uh, that that, that, that uh, yeah, she yeah, is yeah, yeah. she is a real uh, real Muslim. Now, just just, just to be fair, ladies and gentlemen, you do have Christian pastors and stuff who say, "Ah, oh, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and and get it, and whatever God wants to happen, uh, you know, happen." But it's kind of a different category. If you if you have a Christian pastor saying that Christians are immune from to this disease and uh, only Muslims are getting it, and that's because Allah, is, you know, I mean, or, or God or Jesus, or whoever is is punishing. Uh, Go ahead and make fun of that guy because he deserves it uh, for for saying that stuff. There are too, there are too many. I mean, we're talking to a guy who's got it right. We're talking to a Christian uh, yeah. apologist who's got it right now. Um, yeah. oh, this is a kind of a different kind of question, but um, um, God is good. Seven 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 says hello, Sean. How can I learn more about your epistemology of religion? So um, there's a couple ways. We we actually also have. A, a, a deeper group, but I don't want you to have to pay money to, to do that. But definitely go over to Believing Thinkers. We're gonna I'm gonna be diving into that quite a bit. In fact, David, can I plug a, a episode we're gonna have? I'm laid back. You can plug anything you want. All right. So Saturday, this coming Saturday, I'm gonna have uh, Dr. Liz Jackson, not related to Michael Jackson or Jackson Guitars, but she still rocks, and she's gonna be on. It's that was that was it. that was terrible. It's, it's, she's, she's still going to be on this Saturday on our channel at 2 p.m. Eastern time, talking about credences and belief dualism, which is in, it, it sounds like all nerdy and whatever, but it's it's profound, um, and, and as far as what the the ramifications are, I think for for religion and whatnot. And I'm going to be diving into it a lot more. In fact, I joke around with David saying, "What do you think about Kali epistemology on the mixed martial apologetics?" And he just looked at me, didn't mm -hmm. say anything. I'm like, mm -hmm. "Oh, that bad, huh? Mm -hmm. All right, but." That's sort of my thing, and, and, and the reason, just so you guys understand why, is that epistemology is really at the heart of everything we do in, in terms of what is knowledge, you know, how can we obtain it, justification, truth, and, and so we, we deal with it all the time. David deals with it in his apologetics. I deal with it when people argue with you about what counts as evidence. That's my particular forte, and so I'm doing an interdisciplinary study of law and, and, the, and that to show how one sort of demonstrates the other but we'll be doing a lot more on believing thinkers not as much on the mma channel mm -hmm. so um michelle marie says um let's see michelle marie and the super why well, is not going in whoops okay michelle marie says um sean how fast did the coronavirus come on is it like the flu where one minute you feel fine and then all of a sudden you get hit with a fever and ah. inability to breathe i've had that experience where i'm just totally fine then all you know five minutes later just horrible yeah, it did. It for me, it was. Um, it's hard to say because I I, I don't get sick much because again we isolate. We we are already. I, it's not that I'm a shut in. It's just, it's a long story. I was in a bad car accident back in September. So I was without a vehicle for four months because GM workers went on strike went right when it needed to be repaired. So I literally didn't leave my yard for four months. So I've gotten used to living that way. I don't get sick that much because of it. So I noticed quite possibly because I don't get sick as often. Who knows? 
So I, I sort of felt the ramp up a little bit. Now, however, yes, once it kicked in, like that, the, especially the tightness in the chest, that was all of a sudden. And that's what was, to me, was terrifying. Because um, when I woke up at, in the middle of that, that night gasping for air, that, that sort of, st- <laughs> I was like, okay, I might need to go to the hospital tomorrow. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, this is completely unrelated to anything, but uh, John Buckley said, David, what's your opinion of Christians listening to classic rock? Uh, John Buckley, I listen to classic rock. Uh, oh, thank God. Yeah. I, was, yeah. <laughs> I, I was listening to some yesterday while studying. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, listen, I mean, Pink Floyd's my favorite band of all time. Like three of my top f- top 10 favorite songs of all time are, are Pink Floyd songs and so on. I would, I would say it's going to come down to the person. If you're, you know, if you're, if you're listening to, to some band that is, influencing you to have negative thoughts or something like that uh then you you personally might not might want to to veer away from that that doesn't have to be that 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 could be anything um if you know like me it helps you know that just the the sort of rhythms it helps keep me alert while i'm working and doing stuff right and so you know it keeps it keeps your it keeps your brain fun like uh uh there was actually a scientific study that showed that aerosmith is is on average the best music to listen to while you're driving um because they say you know a, a certain awesome. a certain a certain beat a certain you know right. a, a certain tempo actually stimulates your brain to keep you more alert while while driving and they said on average aerosmith has the most songs that are in that range and they said so put in an aerosmith cd and that'll that'll keep you from uh from dying so that, that's kind of that's kind of that's kind of how you know I, I listen to music and so on but again if you're if it's messing you up and you're i, I don't know yeah. yeah then 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 might want to have some some different thoughts um, uh, Alice Shaw said, uh, Sean, do you specialize in a specific epistemology? I don't know anything about this subject. Yeah, so it would depend. That's a great question. On um, I, I tend to lean in, uh, to internalism and of that evidentialism, although I, I'm sort of still on the fence about some things. And that you're going to find that a lot with philosophers and, and variations to things that you think are just settled issues. But for me, again, evidentialism and the way I deal with evidence is a little different. In fact, what's interesting, and David will know who AJ uh, Iyer or Ayer is. AJ Ayer, He yeah. said this, yeah, AJ Ayer. He said this, um, you may be familiar with this quote. Um, for, for my own part, I think that if one were looking for a single phrase to capture the stage to which philosophy has progressed, the study of evidence would be a better choice than the study of language. Now, that's interesting because he he uh, had a book, literally, Language, Truth, and Logic, and he was an analytic philosopher where they really focused on language. So to say that, you know, it might be better to call it a study of evidence right now, and that's a big focus in epistemology right now, and particularly that's why I, I use my – lean on my um, legal um, studies. In fact, I have friends that are attorneys, families that are – family members that are – a friend that's a judge, so I will lean on them and say, hey, I think I've got an illustration here of something that crosses over from epistemology to law. Is that the case? You know, does, can this count as evidence for this? And, and we'll, we'll talk about it. So that's evidence is really my primary focus. If that makes sense, I'm not sure if that was the question in particular. And that is so relevant to us as Christians, because what can we count as evidence? You know, can the Holy Spirit witness to us be, be evidence? What, what kinds of things can count as that? Mm-hmm. Um, Hayden Tang says, uh, uh, Talking to me, he says, what would you say to Quran only Muslims when the five pillars of Islam are in the hadiths, not the Quran? Now, just to be clear, you know, the 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 mm-hmm. you don't have the five, you know, the, these are the five pillars of Islam uh, in the Quran that comes from the hadith. But you know, the a lot the the elements of the five pillars, like making sure you pray and stuff like that, they are they are there in the Quran. Uh, they're just not as as clearly laid out as they are in the hadith. But to be clear, when you have something like the Shahada. You have a kind of Shahada um, in the Quran where you're supposed to say that, you know, Allah is the only God. There's no mm-hmm. God but Allah. But as far as the full Shahada, where you say there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger, um, I actually brought this up to a Quran only Muslim once. And I said, well, you know, that's not in the Quran. So do you recite? Uh-huh. Do you recite the Shahada? And he goes, no, it's shirk. I'm like whoa, <laughs> a Quran only wow. a Quran only Muslim called the Shahada shirk, and I was like, what? Wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you you're calling that you're calling the Shahada. You're saying all these Muslims around the world who are reciting the Shahada, uh, it's shirk. Uh, he said, yeah. What, what are you doing putting Muhammad beside Allah in there? And so notice it's the same thing. Lots of lots of non-Muslims use to criticize Islam. Wait a minute. Uh, 
you know, in your foundational creed, you've got Allah and Muhammad. You've got Allah and Muhammad. Muhammad has to be in there. If Islam is just, yeah. if, if Islam is really just pure monotheism, it should just be God, 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 God. Not, oh my goodness, yeah. Muhammad this, Muhammad that. Oh, so great, Muhammad. Yeah. Oh, so wonderful, Muhammad, 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 Muhammad. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah, I had my, 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 one of my professors of Islam in college, um, what he said, uh, he said, where, where I come from, I forget where it was, uh, somewhere in the Middle East. Um, but he said, where I come from, we have a saying, say it about God, but not about Muhammad. Right. They're saying, look, oh. you, you can even you can even talk. You can even say that about God, but you better not say it about Muhammad uh, or, or, oh, wow. or, or we're going to get violent. So. Uh, so, yeah, just keep in mind, Hayden. Uh, yep. They have uh, for Quran only Muslims. They regard a lot of what Muslims do. Um, they regard a lot of what Muslims do and believe as uh, blasphemy, especially the emphasis on Muhammad. Uh, if you talk to a Quran only, a Quran only Muslim, matter of fact, I should I should get some of these guys on here and let them break it down. But if you talk yeah. to a, if you talk to a Quran only Muslim, uh, they say, "Look, who is Muhammad? Who's Muhammad? He's a mailman." He's a mailman who delivered a message. He got the message. He passed on the message. Right? If you're he, nice. he even said, uh, "This is this is a." Uh, this is a crown no. on the line. He goes, uh, look, if you're sitting at the door and the postman brings you a letter and it's a letter from the president of the United States, you don't sit there and say, oh, thank you, mailman. Oh, let, let, let's celebrate the mailman. Let's build our all my views around the mailman because the mailman brought me this. He said, no, you say, no, right. thank you. And you focus on the message. He says, but all of a sudden we got Muhammad. He gives a message. He's the mailman in this picture. And we build our entire religion yeah. around this guy. What is this? And so, yep, nice. straight up shirk and paganism, according to <laughs> Quran only Muslims. You should totally do a skit on that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, let's see. Uh, um, someone says, wear masks everywhere you go. Take vitamin D. Do not reduce fever unless dangerously high. Watch Dr. Uh, John Campbell here on YouTube. Have you heard that? Uh, don't reduce it. I guess because the fever has a, a good uh, a good purpose. No, I, I would be careful about that because the problem with the coronavirus fever, now I can understand to some extent the wisdom of the, the sort of naive wisdom of that. And I don't mean that naive as an insult. You guys, if, if you're familiar with philosophy, that, that has a different connotation to it than what you may be taking that to mean. But the problem with the coronavirus fever is it gets high. And fevers are not generally, when you're talking about a high fever, good. It's going to cause brain damage, which is why you need to get them down. So I would caution against that again i'm not an i'm not an md but but i did have a tremendous amount of, of medical training in the in the military and, and throughout my life so um i i don't know I, again could yeah um you, you had you had multiple questions about sleeping in your in your uh in your office and people asking if you had a hand uh, a hammock and taco junebug said how did you sleep in your office uh I, I, now but now before before you even respond you know if you have a couch that's one thing but i'm guessing if you spend all that time in the military you're probably pretty comfortable sleeping in most places so so yeah it, 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 so yes and no i mean yes i am i've slept on aircraft and I, and a c-130 is very uncomfortable to sleep on but you do it you, you usually a sling up hammocks or whatever if it's a long trip um, if you can. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, for me, I've slept with a rock as a pillow. I've literally slept in rain in Afghanistan, uh, with no, nothing over my head. I mean, we, we were, um, somebody called it war wagon. It, we would, we would literally either walk or drive somewhere, get out and walk some more. And you just sleep wherever you're not in tents or, you know, you don't have anything. And then you've got, uh, armor on and you're, you might take your he hard, your head cover off or might not wear one at all depending on the unit but you're going to have that that plate armor on so that's uncomfortable but once i got out of the military i had two two promises i'm going to be comfortable when i sleep and i'm not going to be cold mm -hmm. so and and so i have a giant king size air mattress mm -hmm. <laughs> so you think i'm so hardcore right yeah. eating eating snakes and 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 whatnot in here live roughing it and it was actually nice because I got – this is a small portion of my books, the big mm -hmm. shelf. If those of you guys have watched our videos that are over there, and I have a big uh, open space with some chairs. So I took the chairs out. And... No, uh, no, because I, you know, I know you can get used to something after a while. Now, I guess you've, you're just getting yeah. you're just getting soft over time. But I remember, uh, so I spent <laughs> yep. I spent uh, you know I spent uh, over five years in uh, jails and prisons, and I got out, and a, a normal bed didn't feel normal, <laughs> didn't feel oh, right. 
Yeah, prison. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it was like that. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I built myself a prison bunk. I built, I built, I constructed myself a prison mm-hmm. bunk that was, that was, you know, this, this wide. And uh, I took, yeah. I took a futon mattress and, and uh, sort of uh, altered it so that it was, it was actually like a, a prison mattress. And that's what I slept in until I got married and then had to, uh, had to uh, come up with a, a different plan there. Um, Megzy Me says, do you think the average person will be okay? And that's kind of an issue because, and, and here, yeah. here's what's scary. I mean, if you were, if you were having, you know, if you were, you know, if this was messing you up and, and causing you intense pain, I mean, we're, we're, we're looking at you thinking, okay, you know, you're not, it's not like you're 22, but right. you're not old. And, you know, you've had tons of military training and martial arts training. So we're guessing that you are on the really healthy end of the spectrum. And so if it's causing you problems, yeah. Most people are thinking, okay, then, you know, people who are, you know, older, older and not in as good a shape, uh, what's the situation like going to be like for them? But I, I, I'm guessing, yes, the average person is going to is going to make it through and, 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 and be okay, yeah. right? Yeah, because I, I don't think I was at a point where I was in, 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 you know, my life was in jeopardy. That high point where, or the low point, depending on how you want to look at it, when I woke up gasping for air was one time. And I knew I wasn't short of breath, so I know what to look for. I knew I wasn't, my blood pressure wasn't, you know, in the wrong, either way in the wrong direction. So for the most part, I was okay. Or it wasn't within, it was within tolerable measures, I guess I should say. Um, The other thing is that, yeah, I wouldn't panic. Above all, guys, as a pastor, I'm going to tell you, you don't panic. You know, you're going to be fine. And and whatever condition I'm in, I've learned therewith to be content. Um, And if, if you are a safe Christian, I mean, you know, departing this world uh, is is scary, but at least you don't have to worry about the destination. Mm-hmm. However, the likelihood of that statistically still is still fairly low. And I think the reason we're seeing higher death rates in other countries, <coughs> just, to, just to say it again, is that because they've got an older population, and I'm 45, guys, which isn't, for this is actually a higher risk for this disease. Mm-hmm. Um so part of it, part of it is I'm, I'm a scholar now. So I sit in my office and study all the time. I need to exercise more. Getting soft. I have an in- yeah, yeah, I have an injury. And so that's not helping. I had been going to physical therapy, but as soon as in back in February, when I saw the handwriting on the wall, I, I canceled that indefinitely. Um, so th- there is some of that where you would think I'd be healthier than I, than I actually am in that sense. So that probably played into it to some extent. But you should be okay. Now there are, you know, people that, that pass away. Again, I, what's the, so? What can you do? Eat right, isolate when you can. If you come home because you've been out, wash, wash your hands constantly. Don't put your hands to your face, nose, eyes, or mouth. You know, just try to get in the habit of not doing this. And you know that's going to increase quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And so that can that can really help. Mm-hmm. Social distancing. Yeah, and uh, so on, on the age thing, we we cannot emphasize enough, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, stay away from old people. I don't mean for your sake. I mean for their sake. There's, I mean for their yeah. sake, right? Uh, the death rates are significantly higher uh, as your age increases. So that's why you know, yeah. and and it, you know, the people have pointed out that it kind of goes against your natural inclination. If you're worried and the disease is spreading, you want to rush to yeah. your family and be with your family. Uh, nope. Talk to grandma on Skype. Talk to grandpa on Skype and chill uh, yep. until this thing uh, hopefully blows over at some point. Yeah. Um, and oh, go ahead. Just to put a pin, pin in that last statement I was making, too. Think of it this way, guys. As far as we know so far, none of my other family members have exhibited signs that we're all in the same house and we have not left. And so if we're able to just cut down on that, you know, them getting it by practicing these, having good practices, you know, if you do that, it should stand a reason that you should be able to avoid it as well. Mm-hmm. So that's all I want to say. A um, couple super chats and super stickers that I want to miss. Uh, Solitary Emmy in the super with the super sticker looks like a laughing fox. Uh, Rebel Mark um, in the super chat says, "God bless David and congrats on the views." He's referring, of course, if you. Oh, missed, that's right. You know, One hundred million. I mean, just think about that, right? If the if the you know if on average each one of those people is watching a hundred videos, which I think you know I, I know there are people who watch a hundred videos or more, but I think that's you know pretty high. But even if each person averages one hundred videos, that would still be a million, a million people who've averaged a hundred videos. If it's lower, if the average if the average viewer has watched fifty, then you're talking you're talking. Two million people. Two million people have watched on average fifty of my videos and stuff. I mean, gosh, this is some massive, 
massive right. power here to handle. I don't know if I can handle all this power <laughs> that the internet has given me. And you guys remember, who did he have on his show when he hit a... <laughs> <laughs> who did I... I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> who did I have on this day? Sean Hurst, mix, Mixed Martial Apologetics. Um, uh, Slavic uh, Stritz in the Super Chat says, Zinc and D and uh, vitamin D3 and quercetin helps uh, med cram helps med cram look it up there's like eight words in this in this uh comment that i don't know what they are do you know what you know what quer quercetin is it sounds like an anti it's either antiviral or anti-malaria i don't know i guys i've been out of medicine for a while so i i wouldn't i mm -hmm. my um Sh cheryl r in the super chat says this is for the mass the mass sterilizing fund aka clorox like clorox wipes <laughs> and trickle down apologist fund yeah so I do go around. I I would like to start my sterilizer videos and just like hope a bunch of people follow it and just like randomly go around sterilizing stuff. It's you know it's that's, not, it's that's a good trend. It's not something that's going to totally change everything, but you know if you save if you if 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 a thousand people go out and sterilize a bunch of stuff and you end up saving two or three old people's lives, what the heck? You know that 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 sort of thing yeah. is uh, that, that's worth it. Um. So oh, we already answered that one. We have uh, Lisa Look and JoJo monster with the super stickers uh we have uh, hello worldwide just saying hello and hindu historian said thanks for making these live streams uh, well matter of fact i got that one right here uh hindu historian who is hindu as you might have guessed from the name uh hindu historian says thanks for making these live streams gives me something to watch while stuck at home yeah mm -hmm. that's that's kind of, that's kind of the plan uh ladies and gentlemen i mean it's we're trying to forge a habit here right because you know if you're if people are used to going to work every day and then going somewhere else and then going to you know going to church on the weekends going to other places visiting people and then we all have to and then we all have to you know kind of be be stuck at home uh, i pointed out before that's fine with me because you know what the heck i love making videos all day so that's that's actually perfect for me but uh you know you on the one hand, you don't want to get what's called cabin fever because then you can just start losing your mind and just have to go out and have to start going running around doing stuff. Um, but it, it's good if, if people can make the best of it and just start, mm -hmm. okay, well, let me just do stuff online. And when people are having live streams and stuff like that, you know, that'll be, you know, that'll be, uh, you know, I'll get, I still get to talk to people. I still get to hang out with people. And so we're making, we're making everything virtual. So yeah, that is the idea behind uh, doing more live streams during, uh, during, during this uh, pandemic. Um, Hang on, Pedro Jr. said, uh, yeah, we'll be wrapping up here in a second. But Pedro yeah. Jr. said, David, are you going to make AP became the next Nabil after the debate? And also, how do you answer this objection? When I say he did something wrong, it means I don't like what he did. God bless you. So uh, I, I can't make a AP become the next Nabil, <laughs> next Nabil Qureshi. I know we talk trash and act like that, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, that's that, that's that, that's between God and and uh, and AP. Uh, as for the objection, um, he says, uh, this objection, when I say he did something wrong, it means I don't like what he did. Um, so I guess he's saying if you're trying to defend the idea of objective morality, that there are certain rules that, oh. that, 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 that we, we are obligated to follow. So I guess the, the question is, what do you do if someone says, well, no, what you're really saying, what you're really saying when you say he did something wrong is you're saying, I don't like that. Well, if you if you don't believe in any sort of objective moral standard, that that is kind of what you're stuck with, right? That is right. kind of what you're stuck with. And so I just I just point out the implications. I'll say, okay, so when we talk about Hitler gassing Jews, um, you'd say that that when I say he did something wrong, all I'm saying is, well, I don't yeah, I don't like what he did. You know, I don't like I don't like vanilla ice cream. I don't like uh, Hitler right. gassing Jews, uh, or you know, you know Stalin. With, with the Ukrainians, right? They went in and starved millions of Ukrainians to death, right? You know what they did? They went in there, they yeah. they made it so that they can't they can't get out, uh, get out of their land. They went in, burned all their crops, took every bit of food, uh, went searching for food, brought in dogs to sniff around for food to make sure they weren't hiding any food, and then just left them to starve that year. And you know that was to that was to get rid of their population and and stop them from you know from thinking that they could do what they want. And, uh, you know, starve, starving an entire population to death. Um, you know, are, are you just saying that that's, you know, I don't I don't prefer that. And so I just kind of go down the list, you know, hey, this guy who 
John Wayne Gacy um, uh, raped and killed more than 30, you know, 30, you know, young men and boys. Uh, you know, is that is that just my personal preference? I don't like that. And if I did like it, well, then he did nothing. You know, I, I can't say he actually did anything wrong. Um, so yeah. anyway, that that's I, I just go down the list because. And, you know, you get to the point where you want to just punch the dude in the face and say, did I do something wrong there? Or is that just you don't like, huh? bam, huh? you want to do it again? But you, right. you can't you can't do that. You're Christian. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, what are your thoughts on this, Sean? Yeah, I agree that there's a grounding problem and people. That's what they don't understand. Very oftentimes I hear this objection as if they they understand what we're saying to be that they can't be moral people or these sort of things. And I'm like, no, that that's not the issue. The issue is that you, you can't ground it in anything, guys. In other words, there's no foundation for it, which means it's completely subjective, which is was David's point in the debate with Dillahunty. And of course, there was some either equivocation or some just outright uh, ad hocness going on there. But either way, um, the, the issue is that without that grounding, in, in, in other words, let me put it this way, without that grounding, you can't say slavery was wrong. Mm -hmm. Because wrong by what? Now, I'm not saying that it, it wasn't. In fact, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. David would say the same thing. However, you don't have an objective grounds by which to say it. Because if you say, well, society decides, the problem is back then, society, if they said it was okay, you, you can't, the problem is you're fighting against that. If that Does that make sense what I'm saying there, David? Yeah. With that? No, the, yeah, there, there's no, I mean, the, the entire idea of, uh, uh, of of condemning various various practices right like uh as, as i mentioned before i have a machine for making toast right no one would have a problem with me owning that machine for for making toast i say okay um i own a hamster i don't actually own a hamster but you know i did at one point but imagine i if i have a, a hamster a hamster is a according to richard dawkins a machine for propagating dna you know i have right. I, you know i can own that machine for propagating dna i can own a hamster and i can own a, a cage for him um, you know, you, you move up the line, you take a dog or a cow or something like that. You can own a dog, you can own a cow, you can own these things. Well, what about a human? Can, why can't you own a human? And there's right. just, it, you, it, it's, it's just funny that, that, you know, people like Dilla Hunting and these other guys, these are the guys that rail against it nonstop. Oh, I can't believe in slavery. Well, you grew up in a, you grew up in an environment where people condemn slavery. Thanks to Christians. Christians are the one who spread that idea. You can yeah. go back. You can go back a few hundred years. You can go to the great uh, atheist or deist Enlightenment thinkers, and most of these guys were defending slavery. Why? They grew up in an environment where slavery was was acceptable. And so that if you're if you're just looking at this from a secular perspective, it looks like people are people generally believe what they're taught to believe in their culture. And if you're looking at that from outside, it looks like a big joke, right? It looks like a big joke. So either, either you believe that there is a foundation, there is a foundation, an objective foundation yeah. for uh, not treating people certain ways or for treating people certain ways, uh, or it comes it comes down to something else. And if all the views, if all the views you're you're telling me are just the views of your generation, and if I went to a different place in the world, they'd be different. And if I went to a, a different time period, they'd be different. Uh, unless you have some reason to say no, I'm right, and everyone else is wrong, uh, you, you got no business. You got no business telling people that uh, that that you know what you're talking about. So that, that's my view there. Yeah, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and close that. And I, I did I did see two uh, two uh, a couple more super chats pop up real quick that I will check out real quick, and then we're gonna. Oh, cool. I see two super stickers. That means. Those aren't actually comments. So Radical Love posted two. And we have a, uh, looks like a fox with a heart. I still don't know if the fox is eating that heart or if the fox is just being sweet. And then there's a, and then there's, there's a, there's a nice, there's a nice little fox. Uh, then uh, Toko, Tokukwu Nijoku said, Hi, David, uh, off topic, I know, but I wanted to know what you're doing to support people you're making ex-muslims through your brilliant videos by the way well done for reaching 100 million well sadly mm -hmm. there's there's not a lot i i can do for people who are in other countries so i, I try to encourage them to you know uh you know find find a church if you're in an area with that with the church uh stay safe uh if they're in dangerous countries i tell them if you can get out of the country get out of the country if you can get to a western mm -hmm. country get out of the western country go and tell them you're you're a convert and you want out of there and uh, you know, we'll hope, hope, hopefully uh, things will turn out well. Um, but uh, yeah, there is one of the things that I, I've talked, uh, talked to a ministry in Canada about doing 
is uh, there need there needs to be a sort of entire online experience for for new Christians, right? For people who've left Islam yes. and, and have become Christians, right? Because some people are in areas where they can't go they can't go to a church, right? Yeah. And they can't go they can't go announce to the world that they're that they're Christians and so on. So they you know yeah. they basically need everything to be online. Unless they can get out of there, they need everything to be online. And so the idea is um, I'm gonna have Anthony make a series on I'm gonna have Anthony make a series on uh you know basically running through all the foundations of the faith right so basic theology right. and then we'll have another series that's that's covering all the main main issues in apologetics and so when someone converts the idea will be okay whatever else you if you if you have access to a church great if you don't don't worry about it um mm -hmm. but make sure you get these foundations down uh learn your basic apologetics and learn uh the the, the the basic doctrines of christianity but even after that there has to be sort of some a, a, an online church for them you know what i mean like like to where they can have you know because again some people just are in a bad area mm -hmm. where they do not have a lot of freedom and so you want to help them as much as possible so uh so that's the that's the idea but um yeah as as I'm one guy. I'm one guy so far. It's good that I have, you know, I have some people coming alongside me who can, uh, who can help out with very things. But uh, yeah, this is going to, this stuff's going to take a while. Um, and one final comment. Michelle Marie said, congratulations, David. Uh, 100 million views is an awesome feat for a regular person, but maybe it is easier for someone like you who is the new and who is the new improved human 2.0. Keep up the good work. She's referring to my atheist days when I thought I was a more advanced human being because I didn't have emotions. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, uh, so Sean, uh, any, any final thoughts before we close out? Take, take as long as you want or as short as you want. Uh, anything you want to okay. say to everyone here? Hey, thank you guys, first of all, for showing up, tuning in, and, and, and listening to this old guy speak. Um, we do have a Patreon page, but I don't want to sound tone deaf. Okay, so if you guys don't have the ability to support... Oh my goodness, what a me. jerk! You're sitting here asking people for money no, in the no. midst of a quarantine when everyone's lost their job, you sick, but I was sick person. Say, <laughs> Thanks, Dave. What I was going to say is, I just after all of that, <laughs> when it when it bounces back, you know, you can check it out. Because what we do there, um, I, I wish I could just take everyone over. We actually teach weekly, privately, for Christians. We have a, dis uh, not a discipleship program, but I have a, a couple different courses, including biblical interpretation and other things that we do. Um, right now we're doing philosophy for apologetics and whatnot. So um, for our patrons, but we have to do that on another platform, which costs money. You get the idea. Anyway. Not mm -hmm. something anyone needs to do right now. I'm not starving. My kids eat well. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and thank you for supporting David and what you guys do. Um, I appreciate it because when you support him, John, all of these ministries, it really helps them to be able to get the word out. Mm -hmm. And that's necessary. Yeah, and uh, guys, I'll just say this, uh, n not not for myself, but for, for, for everyone out there who's uh, trying to do a lot of work on, on YouTube, I believe that... I believe that there needs to be massively more work being done, just given the number of people you can reach by making a video. And the idea that, you know, if you go speak somewhere and you speak and you speak to 100 people, then, you know, great, 100 people heard that. And it could be a powerful message and it can impact people. You spend a lot of time crafting an awesome video. That video is there forever, right? That video is exactly you just it's there. It can reach people. It has the power to reach people around the world. Uh, people yeah. in people in countries around the world are going to be watching it, and guess what? They're going to be watching it next year, and the year after, and the year after, and they it, they could still be watching it twenty years from now. And so, this is uh, this is amazing opportunity. I think Christians are way further behind the times than we need to be. We need a lot of people uh, doing nothing but uh, cranking out YouTube videos. But as of right now, there aren't a lot. There, there's me and a couple others. There's me and a handful of others who actually uh, yeah. have been able to go, you know, just be full time, uh, full time YouTube. Uh, apologists. So when you see someone yeah. coming along, like, uh, you know, like Sean, like, like John McRae, like a lot of these other guys who uh, are, are, you know, have, have been building up their channels. Um, I've said it before, I'll say it again. If you are struggling, if you are struggling, and you know, $5 is a, is a lot of money, do not support us. Do not. He just, he just right. said it. He just said it. He's not starving. I'm not starving. So if, 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 right. if money's an issue, do, 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 do not support us. Do not support us. Um, but I also know that a lot of people, a lot of people are fine and they're, and they're not struggling. So when you see someone, when you see someone come along and they tell you, Hey, you know, I've, I've got a Patreon, I'm trying to get on there. Um, no, pro no, five bucks, five bucks or something like that is, is not a huge issue to a lot of people, but guess what? 
that that adds up when you start I'm ta I'm talking for from experience here when you start making lots of videos and people are kicking in mm -hmm. five ten bucks a month but you have hundreds of people doing it all of a sudden you're full time because lots of people were just kicking in two dollars five dollars yeah. ten dollars so again I'm not talking about myself right now I'm 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 good I'm talking about the 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 the, the new guys who are coming along uh, when you see them put up a page if you are not struggling and if you like what they do and if you like to support yeah. them and you're thinking oh but I can't support them a lot you don't have to support them a lot a dollar right. two dollars five dollars all that all that and, adds up and if you can't watch the videos come over to our channel sub that, that, too. that will help us out tremendously guys mm -hmm. um if you go to david's channel and you and you start watching one of his videos and you go i'll come back and watch this later man let it play in the background it'll help his channel trust me i'm not saying don't watch it if you don't like it but i'm saying mm -hmm. if you like it let it play mm -hmm. those kinds of things will help so if you don't have the finances watch the videos that that really helps us believe it or not yeah, and, and guys, that that's massive. When you like it, when you see a video and you like it, and you share it, and you comment it, uh, and you comments on it, all that, all those things, uh, that that yeah. that sends a message to the YouTube algorithm that people like this video, and it makes the algorithm more inclined to to send that video out. So yeah. everyone, everyone can help out. With that said, if you don't like Sean. Don't pay any attention to him, but if you, do, right. if you if you do like him, you're interested in what he's saying, you're interested in what he's doing, definitely subscribe. Definitely, uh, definitely subscribe. And for those of you who can, uh, be sure to support him. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I believe I'm back tomorrow because uh, nice. again, everyone's locked up. I believe I'm back tomorrow with Anthony Rogers and Vocab Malone, nice. both of whom are reformed, and they have requested the opportunity to pre give a presentation on presuppositional apologetics. Ooh. Now, I consider myself semi presup, meaning I like some of it. I like some of it. Um, not the grand picture that lots of people uh, who defend it have of it. But uh, I'll give them the opportunity. They can defend, they, they, they can, you know, because, you know, I like vocab. I like Anthony. So we'll see what they got to say. That'll be tomorrow. And oh, by the way, uh, for those of you who requested when, uh, 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 when Hussein was on yesterday, you know that Hussein works with uh, Zachariah Boutros. Some of you said, hey, David, can you see if you can get Zachariah Boutros on? Uh, yes. Next Thursday, Zachariah Boutros here. Nice. $60 million hit on on his head. So he can. I, 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 I've said before, man, that could fund all of our ministries. So we need to start thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing. <laughs> no. <laughs> all right, everyone. Uh, Thanks, uh, thanks to Sean for, for joining us, uh, Sports Channel, and yeah. catch you all tomorrow.